we must give our full-throated, unequivocal support to the nation of Israel. My commitment to the safety of the Jewish people, the security of Israel, and its right to exist as an independent Jewish state is ironclad even when we disagree. President Biden and Speaker Johnson both reaffirming their support for Israel despite opposition to an invasion of the Gaza border city of Rafah. It comes just hours after Israel seized control of the Rafah border crossing, a critical entry point for aid to Gaza. Israeli defense force tanks entered into the southern city of Gaza on the same day Hamas said it would agree to a ceasefire proposal. While a deal was announced, Israel quickly denied any type of agreement was made, saying Hamas is far from meeting its demands. Overnight, Israel launched airstrikes on Rafah, killing at least 23 people, including six children, according to medical officials at hospitals in Rafah. The invasion has put any type of ceasefire in jeopardy, as the United Nations warns that more than two million people in Gaza are facing famine. Joining me now is The Hill's White House reporter, Brett Samuels. Brett, thank you so much for being here. I want to start right off with those developments in the Middle East. Israel has yet to accept a proposed ceasefire deal, which has Hamas has agreed to. The U.S. has continually warned against an invasion of Rafah. So will the Biden administration's stance change now that Israel is going in? So the latest out of the White House on this that we've heard is from John Kirby, a spokesperson on national security issues, uh, was sort of giving some leeway here to Israel in its initial actions in Rafah saying that uh, these actions appear to have a specific purpose of cutting off arms shipments to Hamas through Rafah. Uh, he said that these uh, these actions overnight did not meet sort of the size, scope, and duration of a sort of major military operation, which the U.S. has obviously really adamantly opposed for weeks now and warned Israel not to, to carry out. So uh, the White House is going to be watching this closely. They're certainly going to be keeping an eye out uh, for the fallout from this uh, this initial military action from Israel. Uh, but the White House is really trying to very carefully balance trying to get this ceasefire agreement across the finish line while also making sure Israel doesn't go deeper into Gaza. And while the Biden administration continues its focus on wars overseas, two Ukrainian security officials have been detained for planning to assassinate President Vladimir Zelensky. What type of outreach do you expect from Washington to the Ukrainian leader? And this isn't really the first time a threat has been made on his life, correct? Yeah, you know, since Russia invaded, since this war began uh, more than two years ago, certainly President Zelensky has been no stranger to danger. This is sort of a, an ongoing concern that there may be threats against his life. Uh, he's obviously put himself out there in public. He's been very outspoken. So uh, certainly that is one of the very grave risks that come uh, with being a leader of a country in the middle of a war. So uh, as you said, not the first time this has happened uh, to President Zelensky. And I would expect the White House would certainly reach out to President Zelensky, reach out to Ukrainian officials, make sure that they have everything they need in the aftermath of this uh, this foiled attempt. And obviously, uh, the Congress passing additional aid to Ukraine allows the U.S. to continue to send military assistance to Ukraine to make sure that they uh, are able to continue fighting off these invading Russian forces in the meantime. And switching over to Trump's hush money trial in New York, the prosecution called Stormy Daniels to the stand. Just how significant is Daniels' testimony? It's a big deal. She's definitely the highest profile witness to date in this trial. She is essentially at the center of this trial. You know, she is the person who uh, prosecutors are alleging received this hush money payment to keep quiet her alleged affair with Trump. Uh, during the 2016 campaign. Obviously, Trump has denied having an affair with Stormy Daniels, but her testimony is certain to garner headlines. It was very salacious, very detailed. She's obviously testifying about an alleged sexual encounter with Trump that happened uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, and at one point, you know, Trump's defense team was asking the judge that, you know, some of these details were not necessary, that it was too detailed at certain points. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly some of the most salacious testimony we've heard. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if Trump himself was uh, a bit irritated by seeing her up on the stand and all the attention that she's going to be getting from this. Right. Plenty of interest in what she says in court. Now, at this point, the judge is upping his threats to send Trump to jail if he doesn't comply with the gag order. Is Trump taking the judge seriously or is he just using the judge's threats to play up campaigning from the courthouse? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, Trump has certainly sort of welcomed this idea that he's sort of a martyr in this in this case, played up the idea uh, that he's being politically persecuted and that he's sort of being attacked because he stands between, uh, you know, the government and his supporters. Uh, and this question of whether he's sort of baiting the judge and potentially sending him to jail is is really sort of becoming an increasingly interesting question because, you know, the judge uh, fined Trump for these nine initial gag order violations earlier in this case, and then just this week fined him again for a 10th violation that he found of the gag order. Uh, Trump just uh, had a Stormy Daniels testimony posted on social media about a witness that he had just heard was going to take the stand, and he quickly took that post down. Uh, so he's obviously cognizant of what might be violating the gag order. But there is this question of, you know, is Trump kind of leaning into this because he thinks it helps him politically to continue to play the martyr and continue to be able to say that this judge is, you know, quote unquote, unfairly targeting him. Now, other news is developing out of another criminal trial the former president is facing. A judge just suspended a key deadline in his Mor-a-Lago documents case with this issue surrounding what documents can be used in the trial. Is this a big win for Trump, and how will this affect the case? I think it's fair to say that it is a win for Trump and his team. Uh, you know, sort of the upshot of this uh, this development in a documents case is that, uh, you know, it's going to further delay when this trial might start. Uh, the judge, you know, handling this ruling over what documents can be used in the case, uh, looking at which documents the FBI collected and, and, you know, sort of the cover sheets that they put on them, that they ran out of cover sheets at one point because there were so many classified documents. Uh, but as I said, you know, sort of the, the, the bottom line here is that this trial is going to be further delayed. Uh, both sides and the judge need to work through sort of the latest developments with these documents and how to handle them. Uh, so increasingly, it's looking like this documents case is not going to be heard before November's election, which ultimately is what Trump wants. He wants these cases punted past November when he may or may not be reelected. A lot of interest in when these trials go forward. Now, as the 2024 election looms, Trump's refusal to commit to accepting the results is already putting GOP lawmakers in a tough spot. Those looking to take on congressional leadership positions like Senators John Thune and John Cornyn say they will work closely with Trump if he is elected. How do you anticipate leaders like Thune and Cornyn will work around Trump's election fraud claims? Are there possible leadership positions in jeopardy by challenging Trump? Yeah, you know, it must be deja vu for some of these lawmakers. Obviously, in 2020, we heard Trump refuse to commit uh, to accepting the election results, regardless of the outcome. Again, in recent days, we've heard Trump refuse to say that he would accept the election results unless it was, quote unquote, you know, an honest election or a fair election, uh, which for Trump, you know, in a lot of cases may just mean does he win or not. Um, so it's certainly a very slippery, slippery uh, slope here for, for Senator Spoon and Cornyn, who are vying to replace Mitch McConnell as Senate GOP leader. Uh, we heard, you know, both of those senators in 2020 opposed Trump's calls to reject the election results uh, ahead of January 6th. So I would expect them to play sort of a similar, a similar role ahead of 2024's election, where they kind of push back on some of this rhetoric. But I do think they're going to navigate it very carefully. They're going to continue to be in touch with Trump and his allies to make sure that they're in the loop on all this. Because, as you said, Ed, you know, this could certainly play a role in whether they get elected to Senate leadership, uh, to the top of Senate leadership in the next Congress. Now, here in Washington, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene met with House Speaker Johnson for two hours Monday as she moves ahead with her quest to try and oust him. What is she specifically aiming to get out of these meetings? And... Are her asks even attainable? Right. So, you know, that second part is sort of the big question is, was, you know, whether what Marjorie Taylor Greene is asking for is even realistic or, or able to be accomplished. But essentially, she's looking for uh, specific assurances from Speaker Johnson about various, uh, you know, spending cuts, about agreements, uh, House rules that she is looking for. Uh, certainly, she's looking to pull uh, the House farther to the right. Uh, to make it more stringent. She wants, you know, budget cuts uh, and changes to spending agreements that have already been, you know, agreed to, essentially. So for that reason, I think it is fair to question whether any of this is actually realistic or whether Marjorie Taylor Greene is just looking to send a message, uh, you know, about Speaker Johnson passing Ukraine aid, whether she's trying to expose that, you know, Democrats may vote to save Speaker Johnson uh, as, as Speaker. Um, so certainly, you know, 
her motives may not be, uh, you know, pure as far as uh, trying to accomplish what she's specifically asking for. And there are Republicans in the House conference, we should note, that are essentially trying to warn Speaker Johnson against going too far and giving away too much to Marjorie Taylor Greene, because that's sort of what got Kevin McCarthy in trouble, is he kept giving these assurances to the right flank of the party, and ultimately that doomed him and he lost the speakership. So uh, it will be interesting to see whether Marjorie Taylor Greene does, in fact, just move ahead with this motion to vacate following her meeting this week with Speaker Johnson. While Johnson is facing a potential ouster vote, Senate leaders are increasingly pessimistic about an FAA reauthorization bill passing by the midnight Friday deadline. What are the main obstacles right now that you're seeing and what's your assessment on the ability of the Senate to get this all done by the end of the week? Yeah, so a couple of the key issues here are, you know, one, this FAA reauthorization bill is in some cases used by some senators to uh, pass sort of unrelated items, whether it's about cryptocurrency or banking or things of that nature. So that is one concern is that, you know, some senators may be trying to, to load it up with unrelated items. And that's certainly a concern, I think, for the broader chamber about whether that could sink the bill, depending on what's in it. Uh, and then the other issue at play, which may be of interest to just to local DC residents, is this push over whether to add more flights to uh, the airport at Reagan National Airport here in Washington, D.C. There are some senators who want to expand the flight options at Reagan. Uh, local lawmakers like uh, the Virginia senators have pushed back on that and said it would just uh, create problems for air traffic, problems for consumers. So that's another thing to keep an eye on. Uh, as far as whether they get, this gets done on Friday, uh, that's to be determined. You know, Senators certainly have a way of working these things out at the last minute, but certainly there are a few obstacles for them to work through still. And it's certainly one of the last must-pass bills for this congressional agenda. Brett Samuels, thank you so much for joining us. In addition to reaffirming his position on Israel, President Biden addressed student protesters on college campuses during his speech at the Holocaust Days of Remembrance ceremony. Take a listen. In America, we respect and protect the fundamental right to free speech, to debate and disagree, but there is no place on any campus in America, any place in America, for anti-Semitism or hate speech or threats of violence of any kind. It comes after weeks of protests on college campuses that have often resulted in violence. Meantime, campus protests have spread to Europe. On Tuesday, German police broke up a protest that occupied Berlin's Free University. Protesters on college campuses have been calling for schools to divest from the country of Israel and companies with close ties to Israel. Russian authorities detained a U.S. soldier last week for allegedly stealing from a woman while visiting a city near the Chinese and North Korean borders. An Army spokesperson confirmed Monday that soldier is being held on charges of criminal misconduct. A report from CBS identified this soldier as Army Staff Sergeant Gordon D. Black. U.S. officials have not confirmed his ID, but the State Department says they were, quote, not in Russia on behalf of or in affiliation with the U.S. government. The department says it's seeking consular access. Right now, at least six other Americans are being held by Russia, including former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan and Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gertsevich. House impeachment investigators are set to vote next week on whether to hold the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt. It's part of the investigators' effort to access an audio recording of an interview with President Biden made during his classified documents probe. House investigators already have a transcript of the interview, but have not been able to access the audio. The substance of the interview has little to do with the impeachment investigation. But House Republicans have defended their interest, saying the audio contains, quote, revealing verbal cues as to whether or not the president was being evasive or suffers from poor memory. Facing a U.S. ban, the popular social media app TikTok is now suing the federal government. The lawsuit was filed Tuesday in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. The suit aims to stop enforcement of a bill passed last month that would force TikTok's Chinese owner, ByteDance, to sell TikTok or have it outlawed nationwide. The law signed by President Biden on April 24th gives ByteDance until January 19th to sell TikTok or face the ban. The company says the legislation exceeds the bounds of the Constitution and suppresses the speech of millions of Americans. TikTok is used by more than 150 million Americans monthly. 
That's today's daily debrief. I'm Margaret Chadbourne. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.